Hello Robbie, this is Mashnu and I received your game that you sent me last Friday and I've been looking at it so we're going to replay the game now and um, give you some commentary now before we start I would like to tell you a few things in general that I notice in your, your play and that is that um, you do play quite well but so now and then it looks like your attention your concentration um, diminishes and then you miss some quite uh, simple tactics and I think that is not very difficult to um, to do something about this in fact if you it has to do I think with the um, the way you think during the game and I think that it would be uh, good if you would uh, develop a more let's say structured way of thinking in the sense that whenever your opponent makes a move it's good to ask ourselves what does he want with this move is there a threat what are the consequences of this move what is changing in the position right now in the sense of uh, what lines are open that were closed or what uh, new weaknesses arises after a move and things like that so in fact before we make a counter move first to have a really good look okay what does my opponent want with this and what is happening here and I think that this well when you have a lot of experience later then th you don't need to do this in this uh, structured way because it becomes a second nature strong players have a second nature developed that when your opponent makes a move immediately we look at what is happening here what is he threatening and then we start looking at uh, what, how we could uh, react but uh, I think that if I see the, the mistakes that you so now and then make it would be advisable to really make this uh, a kind of uh, disciplined way of thinking during the game by the way your opponent in this game also makes the same type of mistake so the game goes up and down sometimes you are better than a few moves later your opponent is better and then it moves again towards your, fav your favor so it changes a lot this game but let's have a look it's um, quite a long game so I won't uh, talk too much unnecessarily you were playing white and you played c4, e6, g3 and here comes the first strange move by your opponent he plays g6 and g6 is actually a bit weak because it weakens these dark squares especially f6 here so that's a bit of strange move more common here is to play d5 d5 fighting for the center and then bishop g2 knight f6 knight f3 and then if it takes on c4 then you can just take back that pawn by giving a check on a4 and then picking up the pawn on c4 that's let's say a more common way of playing this position but your opponent went for g6 bishop to g2 knight e7 knight to c3 and now again your opponent plays a strange move he plays a6 I don't think this is necessary to he's actually losing a tempo while he should develop first or or fight for the center first before he, uh, he plays this type of moves now knight to f3 bishop g7 castle king side and now he plays d5 that's the correct way to play it with black go for the center you play d4 correctly controlling the e5 square stopping the, the black pawn from advancing eventually to d4 so he takes now on c4 and now you play e3 um, reinforcing d4 well the, the other side of e3 is that your bishop becomes a bit locked in here but um, it's not a bad move to play um, uh, e3 reinforcing d4 and eventually preparing your queen to go to e2 then your rook can go to d1 on the same line as the uh, black queen now your opponent plays c6 and we can see what he's planning to do he wants to play b5 and try to hold on to this pawn also because of this pawn on e6 his light squared bishop is locked in so what he wants to do he wants to play b5 and then bishop to b7 and then see if he can play at some point perhaps c5 to free this bishop on this diagonal I think that's the uh, the meaning of his um, uh, his move 
queen to e2 and now he plays d b5 indeed and you react with a let's say standard reaction in this type of position that is to play a4 he makes I think a slight mistake here by playing castling kingside so you can take on b5 he cannot retake because after c takes b5 simply knight takes b5 follows and the rook on a8 is undefended so he cannot retake instead of that he played uh, queen to b6 and now you play b takes a6 I think that here there was an interesting move that you could have done could have played and that's knight to d2 knight to d2 makes in fact a new pin here so the pawn on c6 is pinned this rook is pinning the a6 pawn so it makes it impossible for black to retake on b5 and the knight on d2 is ready to capture on c4 with attack on the queen so this would have been a very interesting move to play knight to d2 you took on b6 on a6 I'm sorry now bishop takes a6 now you went knight to d2 place knight to d7 you move your queen away from this diagonal you go back to d1 <coughs> I'm not sure is that a very nice thing to do going back and forth with your queen um, perhaps bringing the queen to a more active place would be good I'm, I'm thinking about something like queen to g4 for example and then queen to h4 and then advancing this pawn seeing if we can try to build up some attack here mm, I'm not sure I'm not sure it doesn't look that easy but I just um, don't like the way this move looks moving the queen back to d1 well let's continue with the game he played queen to c7 and now you played a rook to a4 and well that's actually mm, a bit naive I find in the sense that you you know that this rook on a4 will not be able to survive there it's going to be attacked immediately by knight to b6 attacking the rook and then it becomes difficult to um, to find a good square for this rook so I find it a bit a bit strange actually um, my idea in this position would be for example to play rook to e1 that's an idea to see if we can later try to advance in the center or queen to c2 perhaps we have also a problem here with white with the development of this bishop now so there are enough let's say pieces that could try to find a better square and um, this rook to a4 is a bit of loss of time knight to b6 was played now you went back to a2 with a rook he played rook f to d8 so he's activating his pieces placing a rook on half open file and here you go knight to f3 the knight goes back I've been thinking about another plan and that's to move the knight from d to, from, to e4 and the idea would be to see if we can go with the knight to c5 this is a very good square for the knight it cannot be attacked by opponents pawns he does has, has of course uh, have of course this knight to d7 and then trying to trade this knight but I think on, on, on e4 and c5 there would be a bit better more active than the knight on f3 where it's um, not really going to any special good square you place knight to f5 here you go queen to c2 now knight to d5 and now comes one of those mistakes what I was talking about um, you didn't uh, ask yourself I think here what he was threatening and the threat is actually quite simple it's only one move deep four can be four and you play the rook to d1 now rook to d1 is a let's say a positional move 
you place in the rook on a more active file where it perhaps later the, the game can be opened but um, this is uh, well it's a blunder because of knight to b4 attacking the queen on the rook so you need now to go to b1 as you did you took the rook and you took back so now you are um, an exchange behind he plays here bishop to b5 discovered attack on the, on the queen the queen goes to b1 bishop go, goes back to a6 looks like your opponent doesn't really know what to do knight goes to e4 now now we, we are getting perhaps to c5 he plays h6 and oh yeah that's something else the same actually the same uh, need for looking at direct threats can be important when you play when you want to play in this position knight to e4 you also must think okay what happens what changes with this move with this move your own rook on d1 is undefended and that makes in this position for black a very strong move would be c5 making use of the pin of this pawn you cannot take on uh, c5 and taking with the knight also won't work because of queen takes c5 d takes e5 rook takes rook check and then you have to go to f1 and now comes the move c4 to c3 and next it would be rook takes f1 check and uh, black has a really really good compensation for this uh, queen that he, uh, he traded for a rook and also a piece that is going to fall here on f1 so those are things that well this whole line is of course perhaps too long to calculate uh, for you but it actually the main thing that I'm, I'm the point that I'm trying to make is that before you make a move have a good look at what changes undefended pieces here on d1 the same when your opponent makes a move um, this is how the game continues always ask yourself what does he want what has changed in the position so you can avoid blunders rook to a7 bishop goes to c3 and now he goes bishop to c8 strange move but I don't know what he wants with this the bishop is going nowhere there is no option he has actually blocking his own rook he cannot go to a8 now so it's a very strange move knight to d2 knight d6 bishop to f1 putting pressure on c4 the king goes to h7 again it looks like your opponent doesn't really know what to do there is no need to play king to h7 now you take this pawn and he plays queen to c7 and you go with your knight to um, a3 now instead of this it would be um, perhaps a good idea to trade this this strong knight on d6 this knight can be quite annoying if, it, if you allow it to go to b5 for example or it is looking at the center but perhaps it's good to trade this knight and then queen takes and then uh, I think white has uh, well an equal position here you have compensation for this uh, this exchange that you have lost because of on one hand there is a bit of a weakness here your knight is very well placed here you have the pair of bishops um, so I think this is mm, better playable than knight to a3 mm. I don't know I think this is well it's, it's actually the principle of trading your opponent's um, active pieces that's why, why, why I thought perhaps trading these knights would be better but well this is this is not a mistake knight to a3 what you played it's not it's not bad it's just another idea so queen to b6 now knight to c2 um, you are rerouting your knight the knight goes to b7 I wants to trade this knight on c5 I think that would be my first thought here you play b4 to reinforce this knight he plays he goes back to d6 now now you go to the knight to a1 
I don't know what your plan was. Where are you going to go? You want to go to B3 probably to uh, to have perhaps a second support of C5, but it's a bit uh, time consuming this whole maneuver. It goes to B5, Queen to B2 defending the bishop, and now another strange move King to G8. Well, a very strong move would be to take this bishop and after you retake then to play e5 trying to open the position he has a pair of bishops now so if the center is open then these bishops are going to get really strong diagonals also this pawn now on d4 is pinned so you cannot immediately take here on e5 because then your rook falls so this would be a good way to for your opponent to activate his uh, light square bishop. Let's go back to the game. He played a very strange move. King to g8. He doesn't know what to do. The knight goes to b3, e5, bishop e2. Now he takes on c3, you take back, and well, he plays now rook to e7. So he's, he doesn't want to use the open file, he goes to the center wanting to open the center, that is of course in his favor to open the center with a pair of bishops. Knight to a4 attacking the queen, queen goes to c7, bishop f3, e4, bishop goes to g2, and now king to h7 again, what a strange way of playing, this is just losing time. Rook to c1, attacking c6, the weakness, he plays c5, and now you take on c5 with the pawn. Well, it's, this is a moment where you have to make a decision whether to um, improve your pawn structure like you did by taking with the p-pawn, then you, all your pawns are together. Another idea would be to activate your pieces by taking here, for example, with the knight from a4. So, knight takes c5. And then if bishop b7, then knight to a5 and then these two knights are working very well together so that would be another option um, let's see how the game continued b takes c5 queen to c6 is blocking the pawn and attacking the knight on a4 your knight goes to b6 now bishop to f5 Knight to a5, there you go. Now you're activating your pieces and threatening his queens and also threatening eventually to prepare in advance of your own pawns. The only passive uh, piece that you have is this bishop on g2 at the moment. Perhaps it would be idea, an idea to later move the bishop to f1 and perhaps to b5 or to c4 if b5 is not possible. So then your pieces start getting more activity. Queen to b5, here knight to c4 was played, well this was actually a moment to play bishop to f1, bishop to f1 attacking the queen and looking for peace activity, that's what's important here. Let's see, knight to c4 played, queen to c6, knight d6, strong places for your knights now, and now he takes on d6. He gives back the exchange and I don't think that um, this gives him any improvement. You take back, he takes with the queen on d6 and now of course you defend your knight on b6. So as a result we have a position where you are you have a pawn more than than he has, and uh, you have active pieces, your rook and your queen are more active than his pieces, his bishop on f5 is not active at all, and uh, in fact you are, you are standing better here. So rook to e6 played, now you trade queens, um, simplifying the position, going towards an endgame, knight goes to a4, bishop d7, knight to c5, good square for the knight, f5 played now, and here follows a very 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 strange decision um, you sacrifice a light piece for two pawns and that was absolutely not necessary you should have been 
more patient in this uh, position. You played knight takes e4, but simply bishop to f1, activating your bishop, then let's say bishop to c6, then you play bishop to c4, and slowly, slowly you have to try to improve this position, activate your rook perhaps using the b file or the a file, and then see how you slowly can uh, come further here. But with this sacrifice, knight takes e4, f takes e4, bishop takes e4, um, this is not enough. Two pawns are not enough in an endgame against uh, a piece. And this, the, the funny thing actually is that your opponent makes exactly the same mistake. He it looks like like he becomes nervous. He, he he's afraid of this two pass pawn that you have now. So he takes on d4 with his bishop, sacrificing his light piece for two pawns. Now rook to c7, pinning the bishop, and he takes on e4. You take on d7, and we have reached the rook endgame where all the pawns are on one side of the board and that makes it actually the draw chances very very big um, so you, you try to, to win this endgame uh, by advancing your pawns but actually it's um, it's something very very difficult although let's say in, um, in, in Grandmaster practice they they know how to hold this, this draw but on an amateur level it's absolutely advisable to try to win this with white especially if this kind of things happen this is in fact a very big mistake by your opponent playing rook to e6 because if you trade rooks then the end game is one for white a pawn end game with one pawn more with all the pawns on one side this is absolutely well actually also if, if there would be pawns on the other side of the the board it would be one for white let me show you how this happens take here he retakes and then you simply need to advance with your king to force the opponent's king to have less and less space here you can play f5 and if he takes on f5 you go to f4 now he's forced to go to e6 or to g6 if he goes to let's say g6 then you go the other way you go to e5 now he's forced to leave his pawn undefended so he must play for example this and then you capture and then it's a matter of following the king so he doesn't have the chance to defend his own pawn and now here you are you already have a totally one position two pawns against the king so actually this has to do and perhaps mm, well it has actually to do with knowing your end games, knowing when an a pawn end game is won and when it's a draw. So this was actually a, a big chance to uh, to simplify the position towards a one end game. But you can only know uh, do this if you know that this pawn end game is better for white. I presume that you didn't know this so you tried not to try the rooks. You played rook to b5. King f6, g4, rook to e1 again a moment where you could have taken now on h5 take take and then rook takes and then you have you have two pawns two pawns up so let's have a look take take you see you had really many many chances to uh, to win this game but it's it it's needed to uh, calculate and to know a bit more about pawn end games and uh, so you can grab your the chances that uh, your opponent is offering you this is how the game continued you get this check here it went to f7 rook to b2 rook to h1 attacking h4 so you have to defend it rook gives a check and then soon it became a equal position here and you agree to draw. So, well, summarizing, I must say that there is a lot to win for you in the sense of playing strength, and it's not that difficult to uh, to make this these jumps, to make these steps towards a higher level. Um, the, the most important advice I think that I can give you is to 
um, every time your opponent makes a move have a good look what does he want so you don't miss any threat and then uh, when you're reaching the end game have a good look thinking what how would be a pawn end game if I trade the heavy pieces um, but especially the first advice that I'm giving you I think that's the most important because if you avoid this type of um, let's say simple mistakes then your uh, your, your improvement will be really uh, um, visible very very fast all right well thanks for watching this time i wish you a lot of success and uh, i'll see you next time on youtube goodbye